It is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing one of the most prolific writers in dentistry. You write all the time. I love your stuff. Lisa Knowles in Lansing, Michigan. How far away now? Um, how far away is Lansing from Grand Rapids? Is that, what, an hour up the street? About an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was the uh, first city uh, in the world to adjust the fluoride in their water. Yes, that is our claim to fame here in so Michigan, for so, sure, one so of those so big dental things. If you're a dentist, that is our mecca. And yes. uh, I've been there several times. That's a that's an amazing, uh, amazing legacy. So how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm so good. Tell us, so tell us about your website. Your, your blog is Beyond 32 Teeth. Uh, but your website is intentionaldental.com, and that's even your email, intentionaldental at gmail.com. What is intentional dental? So that's my consulting business side. That's my, my business arm, if you will. And then I started the blog site, and I wanted to name it something that I was into, and the beyond32teeth.com you know, kind of concept came up. And actually, I'm going to merge the two of them because the Beyond 32 Teeth kind of branding and concept has taken off more so than the intentional dental consulting, although I will still have that piece of the consulting as well underneath the, only under the big umbrella of Beyond 32 Teeth. Well, that's uh, that's pretty rare that you're a consultant and a dentist. Most, I'd say 99% of consultants aren't dentists. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think that kind of sets me apart a little bit. And honestly, Howard, I never thought I was going to be a consultant in my whole life either. I thought I was just going to own this dental practice in Charlotte, Michigan for the rest of my life till I was like 60 practicing. And so it was kind of a big surprise to me as I just let that phase come into my life. So and I what, what, what started it? What, 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 how, uh, what made you start consulting? How, how did, how was that journey begun? Um, you know, it's kind of a realization when I, was had my own practice uh, that I started seeing these patterns in my patients with their oral and systemic health and I realized that I was communicating to them in a different way. Basically, a couple of hygienists who subbed in my office pulled me aside and said, well, how did you learn to do this? And I, you know, to me, I was like, do what? This is just me. And we'll talk to the patients and get them to change their behavior and, and, you know, get them excited about their health and seeing all these things and talking to them. You know, we've never done this before. And it was a little bit naivety on my part. I just thought every dentist kind of evolved like that. You get, you know, we get in our little practices and our silos and we go to some CE courses and learn our, our, our certain things, our clinical things. But I, I just thought everybody kind of ended up doing that. And that was the goal is to help our patients change their behavior, not have cavities, brush their teeth better, yada, yada. So, you know, I didn't know it was going to happen. But then when I figured out that I was doing something a little bit unique and I had this background in communication um, I think that dramatically helped what I was doing. And then I thought, wow, if I can get this type of change in my patients and I'm doing something a little bit differently, you know, we, we all could be doing this. And, th- and then kind of at that same time, the whole oral and systemic health picture started blowing up and becoming more known in dentistry. And I said, um, as a dentist, you know, I do have a little bit of credibility of seeing the things clinically and then uh, being able to talk about it too, which is, and then write about it, which again, with the third part about writing is a lot of dentists don't, don't like to do a lot of writing, just haven't had a lot of background in it. So I was lucky um, that I chose that as my undergraduate major, kind of as a backup plan, really. I wasn't sure I was going to get into dental school and I didn't want to be a chemist or a biologist. So I said, you know, um, sports broadcasting or journalism, that, that was plan B. And so luckily, plan A worked out, but hit it just perfectly right. I mean, communication is so hot right now. We need we need that so much with our uh, doctor-patient relationships and getting along with our teams. And so it's worked out very well. Good timing on my part. So you're talking to thousands of dentists right now, um, and they're probably all alone um, driving to work. Um, all The reason our podcasts are an hour long is because that's what they're all telling me they want. They have an hour commute. So talk to the individual. Who would be a perfect fit for you? What what does your consulting do? How much does it cost? And who who are the people that invest in you and um, make a good client? Um, so good the fit? vast the vast majority of um, of my market or in my consulting business goes after speaking and writing opportunities. So I'm looking for those people in their dental societies or dental groups 
who want to have a little bit different picture brought to their group. Um, they want to learn how to be more effective communicators. They want to understand more of this oral and systemic health picture. They, they, they're hearing about it, the research is out there, but yeah, what now? So they don't really know what to do with it. Um, you know, we have this expert role as dentists. We keep telling people, oh, you did about this, you, you know, your, your periodontal disease is correlated to, could be correlated to your heart disease. And, um, but we keep doing this kind of top-down type of management with our patients. And so patients still aren't really changing their behavior and it kind of goes in one ear, out the other. We're not getting as much value and purpose out of what we're doing. So that's where I come in and I talk to the groups and speak to the dentist and say, hey, you know, have you thought about this angle? What about this? Um, and relate that to the oral and systemic health connection, but also in how to be a better, better communicator and truly evoke change. So that in turn sometimes has turned into some coaching, uh, mentoring for specific teams or even dentists in general who just want to kind of up their game a little bit. They know that they're not being as effective in getting some of the change or doing some of the things in their office that they want to do. So they, I've worked with teams as far as um, working through some conflict resolution, creating goals. I love the business side of dentistry too, having owned my practice for a number of years. It, you know, it just, you just have, I just have that little bit of wealth of knowledge that I can help most dentists through what, what they're struggling with. You know, it's kind of funny because you know, humans think at 2015 we're really advanced, and uh, but you know, when you think about the fact that from now to Cleopatra was a shorter time period than from Cleopatra to the building of the pyramids, and when I stand back and I look at you know just all human history, we're we're still really on the um, the witch doctor theory. I mean, you 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 have some you know, you you've said changing behavior several times, and nobody on Earth is is really starting to get that. I mean, they still. They have something wrong. They go to a witch doctor. He pulls out a, a knife and cuts something off, or he gives you a <laughs> lotion or a potion. And right. today the lotion and potion is Pfizer and Merck and Johnson and & Johnson and, and GlaxoSmithKline, and they still just want to do surgery, surgery, surgeries. And the medical model is really the witch doctor theory, and it's really extinct and, and trying to get people to realize that, you know, I, I, I think AIDS was the first one that brought it to the whole planet that, you know, that you have a behavior, you have unprotected sex, and you get a virus, and you die. And, right. I, and that, that kind of started it in 1979 in Los Angeles. And, and today, um, it really comes down to if you're going to be an effective doctor, uh, a doctor, Latin word teacher, you, you right. have to teach them to change your behavior. And that's not really what dentistry is based on or medicine. It's, it's drill, fill, and bill. It's do procedures, bill. How, how, how do you think we'll change that model? Well, I, you know, another one of my great choices in my life was marrying my husband, who um, has a PhD in higher education. So he comes from a whole background in education, and I've ha kind of learned with him and grown up with him the, um, you know, education model to teach. And so he has uh, studied a lot in leadership, and we were both RAs and that type of thing in uh, college. So. We got the counseling, a little bit of background, and that teamwork development, that all that all that touchy feeling, soft skills that people kind of poo-poo, but really, in reality, that's what it's all about. I mean, you have to have the hard skills, you have to have the clinical knowledge so that you know what you are doing, but you also have to match that with those soft skills. And that education background, you know, has has been awesome. I um, studied that a little bit more than I ever thought I would, and and. I think that's that's key. We have to be able to do that, and probably in our curriculums too. And I, th I think it's coming. Uh, the dental schools are realizing that it can't all just be clinical uh, information. It's how to teach. Like I love that the you know the Latin beginnings of doctors to teach, and we forget that so often. And I think that's um, another reason what spurred me to go into the consulting and speaking role is I love to teach. And uh, I get great satisfaction out of other people succeeding. I think you probably have a, that in you, too, as I've listened to some of your podcasts and, and writings and things. So, Well, the, the biggest secret in wanting to teach more is that there's about, I think, about 278 dental societies that pick speakers to come in. And they're all volunteers that, you know, they'll go to a room at dentist. I need three people and they'll give them three subjects. Well, they go to the online C course on Dental Town where we all the courses are an hour. 
And so let's say I picked you for endo, and you'll go listen to six guys do endo for an hour, and you, you'll pick one of them. I mean, I know a guy who put up an endo course and got booked 76 speaking gigs in one year. And yeah. so if you if you if so if you or any of your friends want to speak more, um, have them realize that online see at Dental Town, we put up 350 courses. They've been viewed over half a million times. And everyone who puts one up starts getting, uh, can you speak to our study club or whatever. But what are, what are you um, – so what what are you trying to what behaviors are you trying to get your patients to change? Um, what are you telling them about the oral systemic health connection? Um, a lot of times it's an awareness. It, it, so often we've just been taught to disconnect our bodies from like we've related and we've relied on our physicians or dentists, or the dentists to take care of our teeth and the physicians to take care of our bodies, and we've almost just separated from that. So kind of having ownership again and we all talk about oh having our patients own their own disease you know that's that's the big holy grail in dentistry of not making them feel like well you did something after this filling you know it hurt and what'd you do doc well it, it let's let's go back to where that all started you know about the how did you get the cavity in the first place what type of uh, things are you doing oh well you know i I work all night, so I have to sip on coffee. And well, do you have anything in your coffee? Well, I have creamer and sugar. And so just really stepping back with them and helping them identify what it is that is the root cause of their problems. And I think we get so busy and so distracted in dentistry and focused on their teeth that we don't always take the time to step back with them and just help them own their disease. And it's become so much more satisfying for me as a practitioner of it's not my fault. <laughs> it's, I'm, do, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you learn about your body and, and what's going on and how your choices are affecting that. And that just great, creates so much more satisfaction. And the patient is, is empowered, too. I mean, I think that's about, you know, what I'm about, too, is empowering my patients to take control of their their lives, their health. It, it's your health. You have one body. You know, I say that a lot. Um, and I'm here to help facilitate that process, to help you keep your teeth, keep your health. And you know, just getting them to um, floss is almost like an empowering event that they don't even think about. So when they when they learn how to do that and they're making change, one small little change, and they see the uh, effect in their mouth. Oh my gosh, my gums aren't bleeding, and I'm not spitting out blood anymore. All of a sudden, they they realize they can do something. They even if it's the smallest little thing like flossing their teeth, and and making change in their health. Well, that usually leads to oh, and then we can have you know you build that relationship have bigger discussions, go into deeper things like their weight loss that they've wanted to do, or, you know, they just beat themselves up self-esteem wise, uh, self-esteem wise. So we have deeper conversations. The more you get to know your patients, um, the faster you get at it too. I know a lot of people probably listening and saying, when the heck would I have time to do that? That's crazy. I didn't do, I didn't go to dental school to be a therapist or a counselor. And, and I, you know, I had no idea that would be part of what I was doing either, but, um, it seems to always go back to that if you really want to help a patient change. And and the, the, the model I, I, I think is, is crazy. Like you, you look at studies from the American Dental Association and say like 60% of kids at age 10 have never flossed. I mean, just never. And then they come in and that hygienist flosses their teeth for them. And the research on getting your teeth clean twice a year, you really can't correlate that to any changes in, in really anything. But mm -hmm. if you spent that that session saying, well, okay, here, Lisa, here's the piece of floss. I want to see you floss your teeth and then coach you while you floss your teeth uh, and then and then put stain on and then give you a toothbrush and a toothpaste. But they think, well, I got to floss your teeth and I'm going to use a Profi cup and I'm going to use the deal. And they, they do this automatic car wash, but it's what they would teach that patient to do every morning and every night the rest of their life that right. would eradicate their disease, not that you can come in every – then that's, that's that witch doctor mentality that, well, you yep. don't have to do anything every day. You'll just yep. go to your hygienist twice a year, and she'll be my witch doctor and take care of it for me. And and I, I, I what what percent of hygienists do you think um, during the profi would would stain the the patient's teeth and then watch the kid try to brush off all the plaque removing stuff? Well, not I mean, uh, fortunately, that's the other good thing is I've been in a number of associateships before I owned my practice, and now associate shipping again after I sold my practice. So you know when you're a, when you're solo again and you've only been in one or two practices, you just think that's how it is. And you're so busy and you kind of let your hygienist do what they do. Oh, well, they went to hygiene school. Clearly, they're the experts on this. They're doing what they want to do. But 
what I've learned over the years was that they, that's what they do is they do it for them. I'm like, well, it's the whole concept about giving a man a fish, you know, you either teach them to fish and they'll eat for a lifetime or you can give them a fish and they'll eat for a day. Well, that's crazy. We're here to let them, you know, have a healthy mouth for a lifetime, not just for twice a year out of the day. So I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, a stickler about that. And, and then so I would end up needing to teach my hygienist how to do that. And it was a surprise for me as a, you know, as a leader, as a dentist, I thought that's what they were learning in hygiene school. And I think we take that for granted. And, and I'm not dissing hygiene school by any means, like they're learning great things, just like we do. We didn't, we didn't learn everything in dental school. So um, I think it's having that new perspective that, yeah, you're going to have to coach your team. You're going to have to teach your team how to teach your patients. If your end goal is to have better health, overall health for a lifetime, well, it starts with us. And a lot of times, just like you said, you've got to teach the hygienists, okay, you're going to have to stain their teeth. You're going to have to show them about plaque. You're going to have to show them about flossing because they have no idea. Um, I do something with a hygienist, a lot of times, a, a concept called member check-in. And so after I go in, you know, the hygienist is clean their teeth and talk to them about where they are missing their brushing, they're, you know, they have a lot of plaque. I walk in and I'll say, oh, how's it going? And then I'll say, okay, so, so what'd you find out? Where are your trouble spots? And I'll ask the child. And they kind of look up at me like, uh, you know, they're maybe half listening, maybe they weren't. And so it's one more time that we have the opportunity to show them and, t and explain to them, well, this is where your trouble spots are. This is where the plaque's hanging out. Once you work extra hard, next time you come in, we're going to look at this area and see how you're doing and give them a little pep talk. And But yet know that we're holding them accountable. We want them to learn. And so that's a, a new concept. I, I usually put into a practice when I go into it um, if, they're, if they haven't already done that. Lisa, I'm going to ask you a question very delicately because I know in, uh, in our society, if, if men talk about women, they're sexist. If you talk about different races, you're racist. But th this is what I see if you were me. I get, an, if, if I got 10 emails about leadership skills and trying to lead a staff, nine are from women. Um, a lot of consultants think women dentists are having more leadership challenges in their office with the all-women staff than men. Um, some say, well, when these little girls were young, their dad sat in a chair and said, honey, get me a beer. And she'd jump up and get him a beer and, you know, do all the cooking, cleaning, whatever. And that, and that all the, all the people in our country grew up with that behavior. And they say they, they go into a, uh, they got an associate as a man practice and he would come in, everybody scramble, everybody work. He'd say, do this, 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 everybody run and do it. Then she buys the office for 600,000. And then she says that, and they don't do it, and they don't jump. And, and they, they seem to have – and so I've talked to many other consultants. I've talked to Linda Miles, Sally McKenzie, Sandy Pardue. I've I talked to so many. Mm -hmm. I said, are you hearing this too? And they go, oh, yeah. In fact, the Arizona Dental Association just had a special conference for women issues in dentistry and leadership is all deal. What, what can – do do? So, so my question is this. Do you think that when the boss is a woman like Dr. Lisa – versus Dr. Howard, that there's different issues when you're dealing with an all women staff? I think there can be. Um, it, you know, we definitely were encultured differently. Um, uh, what I see sometimes is a lot of women who are dentists, they're very driven. They're very competitive. I mean, it, it, let's face it, it took a lot to get to dental school and to graduate and to survive that. So these are from very strong, driven women. Um, that being said, a lot of times we are in a culture that says women are accommodators and we are pleasers, people pleasers. Um, and so we get mixed messages from what culture, what, you know, what we want. Well, we want you to be strong, but we want you to be soft. We want you to understand us, but we want you to be tough. So um, I think women struggle with that a lot. And that's one of the things I kind of do a little executive coaching um, with men and women, actually, when you're bringing in a female associate, if you are an older male, um, there's just differences, whether it's generational or gender or, you know, there's, it's just very difficult. So um, I do think there so, can be issues. Um, well, what, 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 what advice would you give? There's, there's, Sally's driving to work right now. She's 30 years old and she's got a hygienist, two assistants, two receptionists. What advice would you give her to how, how, how can, can you learn leadership? I mean, is this something you're born with and they've already been 
um, built with their culture and their their shape. How how can they be more of a leader? Yeah, I think I think it's actually. I mean, it's, I think you might have some tendencies to have some inner leadership qualities, but I think you have to learn it totally, uh, men and women. Uh, and we certainly don't get any of that in dental school. Um, a little bit maybe if you're involved in groups and you're working with. Uh, people, but it's interesting because we're working with really high achievers in our groups in dental school. So, you know, something needs to be done and, you know, six people jump up and do it and, you know, do it out, try to outdo each other and who can do it the best. So it's a little bit different when you're working with all different age groups and you're thrown into a practice who's had, uh, you know, two hygienists already there and you're trying to hire another assistant. Um, and so my advice would be, um, you don't have to be friends with everybody. And I think a lot of women fall into that trap of, oh, um, everybody's got to like me. And the other thing that I'm, I was going wanted to go back and speak to is you said a lot of women are calling or asking or speaking about having trouble with that. The other thing I think is really different from men and women is that women will ask for help. You know, traditionally men will, like I said, the proverbial drive around the block for like I know. 80 hours and not find where they're going. Whereas women will be like, Give me the, where am I going? Give me the answer. You know, I'm going to ask for help where I think in, um, you know, men will just say, oh, what, just take care of itself or I'm going to say this and this and this and um, if it happens, it doesn't or I'm going to go close my door in my office and it'll take care of itself. I see that a lot too and I'm <laughs> from the male side of, of the, well, the I, 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 I wanna... they won't ask for help whereas women are saying, all right, help me. Let me, let me, I got to do this. I got to manage my home. I got to manage my business. I got to manage these teams. I don't have time. Let's just get it. Let, help me out. You you said your backup was a communications major and it would have been sports journalism or sports broadcast. So you're a big sports fan. I take I it. Am. I and am. What, I play what, a lot of sports. And what, what did you play? Um, I played basketball and softball and a little bit of volleyball in high school. And then I played uh, softball so I, at Alma College. So I'm assuming you're over 5'10". Uh, no, no, I am, I am five, seven, five, seven. And you played basketball and volleyball. That's amazing. But tell me if this is a fair analogy or not. I, I love, uh, sports because I just luckily live in Phoenix, Arizona, the town of the greatest NFL football team that ever existed. The Arizona Cardinals <laughs> second to none, but you, but you notice when you watch sports, the, the coach is just in the game on the sidelines, calling timeouts. That's just totally the conductor of the sports orchestra. And then I go into every dental office, and as soon as Dr. Blind in One Eye finishes his root canal, he goes right in his room and shuts the door. And sometimes you walk in there, and there's like two assistants, or just two people standing there by the door, and I say, what are you doing? And they'll say, oh, well, I'm waiting for him to come out because i got to ask him. And I'm like, what? You're <laughs> waiting for him to come out? Why don't you, know. you kick the damn door down and say, coach? So, so what, 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 do you, what do you, I mean, so when you say leadership is skill, do you, do you think, do you think when a dentist is done with the root canal, they should be walking the floor? I mean, I, I'm walking, you know, I'll go into just the hygiene rooms and tap the patient on the shoulder and I'll go out in the waiting room or someone says, well, John up front is upset because we're running 10 minutes late while they're setting the room. I'll go up front. I'll apologize to John myself. How do you, is, is that something that you think is trainable? I, I think it is. Um, you have to have the right attitude, certainly. Um, I, there can be this perceived privileged attitude and expert attitude that some dentists come in with that I'm the doctor, I'll do what I want, um, and that's the way it's going to be. But I think you and I know that that's not the reality of it, too. Um, there are things that need to be done. You need to empathize with the patient who's mad out front and if there's nobody who is doing that right now then it's it's got to be it's got to be you so i'm a i'm a hands-on type of leader um excuse me um i've got a I've got to know what's going on and i'm a constant listener and i'm always listening and my my staff when my uh team in charlotte they they always accuse me that has like bionic hearing because i'm always listening to what's going on i can you know I'm, I'm with the patient but i'm also hearing that upset patient up front or i know that the hygienist is polishing so it's about time for the check it's just that awareness and and probably from my sports days that court sense that court awareness of where everybody is on the team and what we're supposed to be doing and it, I think it's hard if you haven't had those experiences, but it is trainable, but you need a coach. And, and, you know, that's, again, where I went into the speaking and writing and just hopefully being able to 
impart some of that knowledge on on those who are struggling and who haven't had those group experiences, those team experiences. I think that's really hard for um, and a clear disadvantage if you haven't had some of those team experiences to know even what you're looking for and understand your role and realize that, oh, well, I might be having to help define the role, <laughs> not just trying to figure out what my role is. I'm trying to help others figure out what their role is. And so we clearly need more leadership guidance in our profession. It's funny. I was talking to the dean of uh, Arizona State University, and he was telling me that um, for almost 20 years, the main feedback they're getting from all the major employees is, you know, you, this kid graduated the 4.0, but he doesn't know how to work with other people. So they've been massively changing the curriculum for two decades with all these group projects. And it's funny. When my boys complained about college, they never complained about anything they were doing solo. They always complained about all the stress of the group and Mark didn't get it on time and Shirley disappeared and all that stuff. And I, said, and I kept telling them, well, that's real world. You know, who yeah. cares if you know algebra and physics? You got to learn how to work with the, this group. And what's funny is what is the, what are dentists, what is their sport? If you ask a hundred Americans, what's the dentist's favorite sport? What sport would they say? Golf an individual sport all by yourself <laughs> out there. And, 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 and the reason I don't like golfing with dentists because they don't like to talk. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I can't go 18 hours without talking. That's me too. Yeah. Like golf and extroverts don't go well very yeah. well. It's like, it's like if you think it's fun to go out there and not talk for 18 hours, I mean, you know, I, but, but so they, they're introverts. They like golf. They yeah. don't like team sports. They're, and, if I, and if I lined up 100 dentists every year for the last 20 years, said, what is the number one thing stressing you out? In your dental career, every one of them say the, the team, the staff, the hygienist, the assistant, my, my crazy receptionist, blah, 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 blah. And, and that's, that's, that's the whole game, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, if, and I guess I, I'd give a glimmer of hope to those people who are more introverted and that's not their style is, but you got to recognize that and you still got to play. You still got to know how to be an extrovert. Like my husband's an introvert and I'm an extrovert but he knows how to be an extrovert. It's tiring for him at the end of the day, he's much more tired than I am. I'm energized when I'm in a group of people, I get a lot of energy from that. Whereas that's very energy zapping for him and he's he's ready to be done. He's like, just wants to come home and not talk to anybody. But he knows how to be an extrovert in a group. And, and we have to do that as leaders. Um, and so it, it doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't surprise me too that, the, that a lot of dentists like to golf um that <laughs> so so what so what website are you are you um would my listeners learn more from if they want to learn more about oral systemic health and leadership would it be beyond 32 teeth.com or intentional yeah, that's where they could read a lot of my articles that i i, I on write beyond 32 teeth.com yeah and i you know so i try to cover all the issues beyond 32 teeth and you know that's sometimes i get criticized for that of well, you got to pick a pathway you got to pick a lane um, and, it's, and I mean, I have to some extent to talk about the oral and systemic health, but so much um, of being able to communicate that is about yeah. the communication and the business side too. I mean, you can't just ignore the business side of your practice either and say, oh, well, I'm going to be the best communicator and I'm going to take 45 minutes to talk with you know Mary Smith here. And well, you can't do that. You have to be mindful of your business side as well. And so that's where I, I really kind of talk about the middle ground or the middle path of you have to be able to do both. It's you don't get to choose one or the other, and it seems frustrating and un, you know like an unending uh, achievement op opportunities as when you're starting out. But truly, you've got to you've got to learn a little bit about everything, and maybe not master everything. And I think we dive into some things. Oh, I want to I want to go learn endo, and we spend like a year just honing our endo skills, and you know the the wheels are falling off in the practice. But you know they're doing darn good <laughs> endo, endo work, which is important, but you also, you can't just focus in on that solely. You've got to keep track of your human resources component. You've got to keep track of, you know, what the, what are, what's the bottom line looking like? So again, I, I feel like that's what I offer um, when I speak, when I write. Is my, my, my gut tells me on the 80-20 rule that 80% of the people flying off to these um, continuums on the weekend to learn how to be cosmetic dentists at LVI or occlusion rehab guys at Panky or Spear or Coise or whatever, they're flying out of their town because they're leaving this stressful, crazy <laughs> thing. And yeah. they think if they go and become an expert in occlusion or sleep medicine or endo or implants or the pinhole technique, that they'll come back and all their problems are solved. I mean, I've thought that all the time. And then it seems like if your house is very, very healthy 
and you learn how to navigate the staff, and then you want to learn how to place an implant, you don't have to fly across the country. You just call your oral surgeon or periodontist across the street and say, hey, will you, will you teach me how to place implants? And he's like, sure. And, and they don't even spend a dime. So it's, I, I think a lot of it is um, that holy grail. Well, if I just go to the paint can suit for six weeks, and, and I, I went there. I mean, I, I made it through five. And they, they yeah. think if, if I just really learn occlusion, when I come back, my business will take care of itself. The staff will all get along. <laughs> if it and, was only that easy, right? You're right. It's like a myth. We want that. I think um, we're just looking in the wrong way. And again, not that we shouldn't be keeping up on our clinical skills. Certainly, we have to know those things and want to keep up. Um, and, but, I, and you but, know, again, but, I talked a little bit before and written about the competitive side of us. We, we love, we're, I think one of the ADA studies shows that we're compulsive, that kind of compulsive people tend to attract to dentistry. That competitive, compulsive nature gets into us and we think that, oh my gosh, somebody up the street has a, you know, whatever, a new 3D scanner or they have, the, they're doing endo now and we're not. And so that, that starts nipping at them in the back of their fear. So then they want to go and they learn a, you know, a different trade or learn a different technology and um, they they miss the mark really you know like you said get get your uh, ship in order first and then when you get that figured out then there's your time to go um, expand and explore what you know some other things you've been wanting to do I, I don't really know if they even have to learn the clinical skills I mean you look at, at clear uh, what, what, what was the implant um, place what was the big implant chain um, is it clear connect or is it a uh... What, what was it? Uh, I don't know. Do you I remember get, the I, big implant. Um, implants for the, the four on the floor. Four. four oh, the oh, floor. okay, okay. What was um that was sponsored by Nova. Who's four on the floor? But but anyway, you know they they, they would get periodontists and oral surgeons from smaller towns of twenty five thousand and come into these big cities and place all their implants and do you know some type of fee split about fifty fifty whatever. I mean I mean, a, a, if if I go to a dentist say okay. How much money did it cost you to go take all these implant surgical cores, buy the equipment, buy the CBC, learn how to trace it? I mean, they, they might be a hundred grand to two hundred grand before they place one implant. And then I see another dentist who does the soft stuff, is the conductor, running the business. I mean, just as a periodontist come in, um, you know, the last Friday of every month and place a dozen implants and splits it 50 50. Um, same with a small town endo, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I still think um, the return on investment is, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll look at look at um, um, the owner of Heartland, Rick Workman. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a dentist. He hasn't touched a patient in 20 years, has 1,500 offices. I mean, right. you don't have to do clinic. Look at um, um, Comfort Dental, Rick Kirshner. He hasn't touched a patient in 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Thorne of Pacific Dental Service, his dad's a dentist, and he thought, why should I go to dental school? It would be a hell of a lot easier just to hire a dentist. He has 500 <laughs> offices. So, right. so I, I don't think you have to learn any clinical skills if you master the business skills, the leadership skills, the conductor skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what your purpose is. I mean, my purpose was to help people and patients. So I enjoy the hands-on experience, that day-to-day -day interaction. I get something out of that. Um, and then when I figured out that I was helping people in the way I wanted to, that's when I made the jump and wanted to leverage my skills and say, okay, now let me help. Let me give back. Let me help where I can help. I had a ton of mentors, amazing mentors along the way, um, and that was crucial to my development. So, you know, people development is also one of my passions as much as helping my patients. So, ultimately, I think if I can help more dentists get what they want, then the more patients are going to get what they want too. So, it's kind of a win-win. I always look for those triple win-win-win. I know it's kind of cliche, but I look for those opportunities, and um, I, I think it it makes you much more happy in your purpose. I mean, if you want to go own 500 dental practices and you uh, have the entrepreneurial spirit and that's what you've always wanted to do, then, you know, go for it. We have the opportunity to do that. But if you truly just want to practice um, and, and make a difference in one or two practices or whatever it is, I think we still have that option too. Um, getting a little bit uh, more scarce, I guess you would say, but I think that's always going to be around in an option. You, you talk about leading with LEED, L-E-E-D, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, Knowledge and Eco-Friendly Dentistry. What, what's all that about? 
Uh, well, you know, I've always been interested in environmental issues since I, since I was a kid. I started the environmental clubs in high school and the reducing, recycling and all that. It was just kind of a side hobby, really. Um, I've always, we've always been exposed to being outside and camping and all that. So just a passion. Um, and then I realized when I brought that into my office and we redid some of the office things, putting in the fluorescent lighting and hiring a after school student to do our recycling was that that was also fulfilling a lot of my purpose too is okay, well, you know, I'm helping out an, a younger student. She's now our recycle person, our part time after school student. Um, and then I realized, well, hey, you know what, I actually reduced my dumpster pickup once a month to once a month from twice a month. So I'm saving money too. And now in, I'm getting the award from our county telling us, you know, great things from the dental aspect. And before I know it, patients are very interested in what I've been doing and, and how great that was. And I thought, well, what the, this was an amazing unintended marketing um, um, help to my practice. We should be doing this more. And I know there's other dentists who are interested in maybe building a um, lead certified uh, practice. Um, the U.S. Green Building Council has all different levels of certification when you go to build a new building or you don't, it's even remodeling, you can get certified. But um, I, I just try to heighten that awareness that, you know, if you are building your own dental practice, you could become LEED certified. Even, I mean, there's different levels. You could be silver, gold, platinum levels. Um, but uh, you're looking at air quality, you're looking at um, just the the energy and feel of a building. I don't know if you've ever been into a LEED certified building. Now, is LEED, is that a federal or is that a state of mm -hmm. Michigan or is that a no, federal? It's federal. That's, that's all. all. And it's called LEED, LEED certification? Mm hmm Yep. And you can get that, um, you know, if you're thinking about building a building or in my case, we just remodeled mine. I didn't get certified um, because I just went through, did kind of little by little. Um, but you can for sure get that uh, certification and then you get this beautiful you know plaque in your in your office and it is an eye-catcher and patients are always asking about it and more and more people you know the green movement is so um, prolific now and people want their whole foods and their natural products and so when you exemplify that as a dentist it really sets you apart um, from the others. And you know, the ultimate message to my patients is, and what they've said too is, well, she really cares about something besides herself and how many crowns she's doing per day. She cares about the environment. She cares about what happens um, you know, uh, to the, the waterways. She must be a very caring person. And lo and behold, that's true. <laughs> So I wouldn't recommend doing this just to uh, for a marketing uh, ploy to be like, oh, that doctor's green. And then if you have know nothing about that, um, you know, patients will see right through that. But if it's something that you truly believe in and you're already using your uh, products at home that are green friendly, you're already into environmental issues and awareness, then I think it's a really good idea and concept to bring into your practice and then market it and to let everybody know what you're doing. Well, I, I you know, that... Um Remember that eco-friendly organization started up by Ina and Fred Pockrass? Yes, yes. And um, I, I spoke at their uh, annual convention one year in Utah, and these dentists were telling me that, you know, they were into environmentalism, but when they started marketing it, they were stunned at how powerful a marketing was and that um, when they were a dental office and they were off the grid and recycled and certified, that people were driving like an hour away. Yeah. And, and, you know, I come from the gener – I'm 53, so I'm, I'm from a generation – you know, I, I'm always reminding young kids when they talk about how horrible their grandfathers were with the environment. I'm like, dude, they were trying to defend themselves from Nazi Germany. And when, when, you're, when you're getting attacked from Adolf Hitler, no one gives a shit about the creek or the pond or, right. you know, whatever. And, in fact, the, the federal government was telling General Electric to dump all that stuff into the river. I mean, I mean they, were, they were trying to win a war. And it's really easy – to be alive in 2015, to sit there and, uh, and, and you know, um, um, health, clean water, clean air, that, that's a luxury item. And that's a luxury item anybody will give away when you're defending yourself against Nazism. You know what I mean? But right. I, I, think it's a, um, I think it's a powerful marketing deal. And so I, um, I've heard dentists that um, in certain states that you can buy your electricity just from solar 
So you, so you can say, I only want to buy my electricity on the grid from a renewable resource. And then they go right on their website and say that their environmental and their dental office is off the grid. And it's huge. You're getting all these. Um, now, now I want to ask you, is the environmental thing, is that a, a younger thing? I mean, is that like a 30 and under thing more so than like a 60 to 75? I mean, I've never, I've never heard a an environmental remark from a grandma or a grandpa, uh, but I always hear it <laughs> yeah. from a skateboarder. I'm sure it's the circles you like that we all run in. I mean, I, when I go to the environmental meetings and things, there's there's people of all ages. But I do think maybe like the 40, maybe, I don't know, I, I, I'm 43, so I got it in school. You know, I started being educated about it in school. Um, so... I think we all started hearing about it more at the at, our, at this age, the 40-somethings and then below. And then now, I mean, this whole climate change, all that talk, I mean, that's huge. That's media coverage all the time, all these weather changes and things. So people are, like, really starting to learn more about it and have more of an interest in it. Um, and, wanna, and, you know, they're getting – people have gotten sick from it. So it, from a health standpoint, for us as dentists, I think it's almost – necessary for us to be aware of what's going on too from an environmental standpoint and how we can um, help impact those things uh, from a health standpoint. So uh, that's another reason why I'm also involved in, in that uh, those aspects and issues is I think if we can you know continue to talk about things like you know, like the mercury issue always gets brought up in dentistry and our dental amalgams and yes we're, we're putting um, amalgam residue into our waterways and in Michigan we have to have the uh, filters now and so we have the separators um, but I know a lot of states don't have that but if you look on the grand scale uh, you know scheme of things coal-fired plants put like the most amount of mercury in half, the atmosphere half, ever. 50%. so so I feel you know once I learn about these things it's hard for me to ignore them and I'm thinking you know we have Two, two coal-fired plants here in the East Lansing, Lansing area, one from MSU, which is actually stopping. The students have been so ad, adamant and so working that so hard that they're actually changing and they're going to all these solar arrays and um, bio-generated uh, energy. And so they made a huge impact there to change that. Um, and Board of Water and Light here in the area is looking, you know, they're going to more of the natural gas type of things versus the coal-fired plants. So it's you know, it's all around us. It's there. It's whatever age levels, I guess. It's just, I think more of the younger people have heard about it in the media now. So they're more interested in it and realize, oh, wow, we, we maybe we should do something about this. You know, mercury is one. And I, I think the bizarrest thing about mercury is the uh, half of the mercury contamination comes from burning coal. Mm -hmm. And but 6%, the dental relay comes from cremating dead humans with mouthfuls of amalgams. So one, one thing they could do immediately is just um, not cremate anyone till a dentist has gone in with a pair of 150s and 151s and extracted all the, all, all the amalgam teeth. But um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I helped fluoridate Phoenix in 89 and got like the Arizona Award from the Arizona State Dental Association and the Public Health Dentist of the Year Award. And I did it again mm -hmm. just recently because it expired after 20 years but man i'm telling you 25 percent of americans do not want fluoride dumped in the water and man they are militant and they defy you know i mean they're, they're not interested in any scientific debate or whatever what, 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 do, you, what do you think that uh, and, and you're right up the street from where it all started in grand mm -hmm. Rapids, michigan january 21st 1945 at 3 p.m um what do you think of the uh, water fluoridation? Do you, do you think that's something where the next generations are going to say, we don't want the government pouring fluoride in our water? Or is, it, is that the same line as mercury? Or are you an environment? Can you be a lead dentist and certified and mercury free and still promote fluoride in the water? Oh, I think so. I don't think we it's it's that to that level. Um, for me, fluoride is kind of a yes and topic. Um, I, I think we've spent a lot of time, energy, and money on fluoride, and I, and I hope and wish in the future that we'll spend an equal amount of time and money on nutritional counseling and relating that to how much sugar has impacted uh, the diets of young kids and Americans and nation, nation worldwide. Um, so it, it works. Um, is it – it's hard because I understand the holistic – 
aspect and argument that I don't want anything unnatural. Um, and so I see that point, but I also, you know, from the healthcare background and the dentist standpoint, I put that hat on, it's a public health issue. It's helped save a lot of suffering from kids whose parents maybe um, weren't as adamant with their diet and couldn't supply as many nutritional good things as maybe my parents did. So um, I think it's going to be a controversial topic for years. Well, I mean, it is amazing because, I mean, you, you talk to these people about the vaccination issue. And, you know, they, they, they're not interested in anything that's written by, you know, uh, PhD, the, the Centers for Disease Control is the government, it's the right. conspiracy, right. Um, they talk about things like natural, I try to explain to them that gonorrhea is natural, that black holes are natural, that you know a meteorite landing <laughs> on your head is natural, you know, um, they, it, it, it's just amazing. In fact, I even got a visit from a police officer because I got a death threat on this, the last, on the fluoride deal, and wow. um, yeah, a death threat, they, they said that, that they were going to kill me. And so I, um, I called my patient who's a police officer. Anyway, long story short, they came back and he said, what do you want to do? She's like 87 years old and she can't even get out of her chair. And I said, okay. So, well, well, there's peace of mind. Yeah, there's peace <laughs> of least mind. I, at least I offered you peace of mind. I may be, I may be 53 and fat and old, but I can, I can take an 87-year-old lady in a walker any day. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's amazing. But I tell you what, I don't want to sound cynical or anything, but I, I would be interested in this lead certification and eco-friendly and advertising that my dental office off the grid just because you're going to get every granola-eating, hippie, snowboarder, lover with crystals <laughs> driving an hour to go to the, the recycle. I mean, they, they love this stuff. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, I, I, I'm even thinking of, a, you know, why fight them, why join them? I'm, I've been telling my boys, you know, if we were smart, we would just cater to them. we just build an all-natural toothpaste and just say, you know, no communist fluoride, no evil government regulations, <laughs> you know, just all natural stuff yeah. made from exploding stars and black holes and, and uh, right. just, just care to me because I, I think it's my job to sit there and say, okay, I know what you need as your doctor and I know that you're batshit crazy and I need to try to figure out a program to where batshit people, batshit crazy people can save their teeth and not have a life of decay and gum disease. You know, kind of where 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 does uh where does crazy meet the road? Right, and I think some of that. I mean, I think that was very traditionally stereotypical. Low those types of people, but it's becoming so much more mainstream, and that's why it's flipping. Because people like me. I mean, I'm a 43 year old professional woman, and, and I buy natural products and or eat organically, and so there's that market that's um. You know, and I can afford dentistry, and I can afford good dentistry. So it, you know, you, you, I think we have that perception that it could be these type of people that are gonna. And you, I'm sure you're gonna get all sorts of kinds of people if you build something like that. But you're also going to get some very mainstream type of people who are just interested in the environment, in overall health, and being. Um, eating well and being organic and you're probably going to get them to buy into a better healthier diet okay you're not going to have fluoride but that means you get to follow the 25 grams of sugar rule that the World Health Organization has set up you know you eat you eat six teaspoons of sugar a day that's it that includes your honey your syrup your everything and if we all did that then we wouldn't have as many but, but, but honey doesn't cause decay because it's natural well, it, the World <laughs> Health Organization says that that's on the list. You know, I would probably argue argue some of that too, but the concentrated sugars in it, I guess, um, make it you know as a, a sweetener that. The the, the research it, I'm reading is that where where you totally link it to is when the food has added sugar, mm -hmm. and there really isn't really much of a connection between sugar, as it is added sugar, and it's it's the added sugar in our drinks and foods, and and I, it was amazing that last year was the first year. America drank more calories than it ate. It uh, consumed fifty-one percent of its calories liquid, and it, and a McDonald's and a big McDonald's Big McCafe or whatever has more calories than a Big Mac. Yeah, and so then as dentists, we have that. You know, again, that's why we're seeing this need surface for being able to communicate better and have behavioral change um, uh, tools in our arsenal because. We're fighting all this, and the the sports drinks, the the energy drinks. I mean, it's just 
one thing after another that we are having to educate our patients on and taking that time and re-educating, like I said, re-educating our hygienists, re-educating our dentists to say, this is the problem. You, it, it, It's not enough anymore to just say, well, you need to drink less pop and don't get too much sugar, don't eat too much candy. And I, and I see that so much and so often. It's kind of like what you said is we're doing it for them and we're just telling them. We're not helping them think through their processes. So. I really love the, the study where they took um, identical twins were over the last 50 years where one had luckily had health insurance and got the $100,000 coronary artery bypass graft. Hmm. And the twin, the other twin didn't have insurance because, you know, 50 million Americans didn't have insurance the last several decades, uh, but changed their, you know, quit smoking, lost weight, started exercising, you know, because they, they couldn't get the, 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 med the, the insurance uh, paid for surgery. And the group that didn't get the bypass but changed their behavior lived three years and six months longer. And we see this in dentistry all the time where they would come in, they had insurance, we did the four quadrants root plane curatage, we did the four quadrants of surgery, and I swear to God, two to three years later, you couldn't even tell you'd ever been in there one time in their life. <laughs> and then there were people who said, no, I don't want that. I don't want you cutting my gums. I don't want the surgery. I don't have insurance, whatever. But they start brushing and flossing every morning, every night, and all that kind of stuff. And they stopped smoking. <laughs> yeah, and, and they got better. So the, the, the whole thing is is back to changing changing your behavior. Hey, I, I, want, to, I want to call out one thing that um, I lived through. When I was in dental school, and that was when they started putting women in the class, and they started putting women in class. I, I remember talking to the dean. He was telling me the chancellor, they, they had quotas. And if they didn't, you know, he could not go back to the governor with a whole class full of men. You know, and, and they, were, they were doing everything they could to fill the class with women. And they would all complain that it was a waste of government resources because these women were going to come out of school and in two or three years they're going to get married, get pregnant, have three kids, and these degrees were just going to be wasted. And it was funny because I was having uh, lunch the other day with one of my classmates, Becky Cecil, and all the women that graduated in my class 28 years ago, they're all working just as hard, just as many hours as all their American counterparts. So I want to ask you, you know, there's so much talk about uh, the changing demographics in dentistry, I mean, when I go into these dental schools, that half the class is women. How, how do you think the profession, how do you think it's going to look differently than going back to 1950 where they were all males to now by, you know, 2025, they're going to be half women? How, how, do you think that'll have any impact on the profession, any change? What, what will that do to the oh, profession? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, actually, when I was, I graduated in 98, and when I was in dental school too, that was what they're telling us is that um, there's going to be a shortage of dentists because women are going to be working more part time. And so, you know, we're graduating a higher percentage of women. So, you know, it's going to be another heyday for dentistry. Um, so, you know, we all are like, oh, good, good, good. Um, you know, I think some of that's true. Women might take time off earlier in their career, but then they make up for it later on. I think I've read some of that research too is they'll work longer um, you know later on after their childbearing years or whatever um, so I it's I think it's really gonna change I, I teach a course in the summer at University of Detroit Mercy um, on communication and the the demographics is so so different I mean so many women so many minorities in the whole face of dentistry is just changing so rapidly um you know probably some some say not rapidly enough but you know when i graduated i think there was about 13 percent women like in the the nation when i went went out into the pool which was in, in, interesting because when i was in dental school it was about 40 percent women and women were everywhere and in the schools and even our professors and things but then when you get out in the real world there's hardly any women not a lot of support groups not a lot of networking opportunities um for women specifically and now uh you know 18 years later there's about 26 percent women nationwide in uh, as dentists so it's definitely changing i think this changes the way um sales are to women you know products there I, I think i just read an article the other day and i saw this nice small little hand piece made specifically for women i was like oh <laughs> i would like to try that and so um the product lines are adapting more um sales forces are having to change their approach um instead of you know hauling the dentist out of his office <laughs> to get him to come look at the things the women are asking questions, wanting to know what do you have, and so it's just a whole different way of thinking and, and selling to women, and um, 
I was just at the um, ADA conference in Washington, D.C., and, you know, that's a, it's a big issue for organized dentistry right now with membership declining a little bit. Um, how do we get more women and minority voices in our organizations involved and want to be a part of this? Uh, women and, and we're, you know, we're busy. Everybody's busy. And, and even men, too, now. Men are taking a different role in the families. A lot of times their wives are professionals as well, so they're working. And so everybody's trying to do child care and there's not a lot of time to volunteer for these organizations go to these annual sessions um and that's a it's a real i don't know it's a real tr troublesome point right now that i think we're working through as a profession and it'll be interesting to see in the next few years how does that all pan out but i i, I think you're just gonna you know it's just gonna blend and blur and 10 years from now it's not going to be as much of an issue as it was it's just going to be the norm of oh well, we have men and women and Okay, <laughs> now what? And I also think it's funny that when you look at the world pool of 2 million dentists, a million 500,000 of them are women. So it was only a male-dominated profession in the 20 countries where there was a lot of money involved. Men always go to where there's a lot of money. Insurance, banking, finance, law. And in wealthy countries, the men all showed up. And I always thought the dentistry was more pure in the poor countries because the women that go into dentistry in poor countries are like the women in America that go into teaching. No mm -hmm. one goes into teaching for money. Right. And no, no, no woman goes into dentistry in Nepal uh, for money. They go there because they, they generally, um, you know, they just generally are there for just all the right reasons. Um, and, I, and I think that's actually probably good influence in a way, if I had to say something as the future is, um, you're seeing all these communication and soft skill issues surface now because women are entering and saying, calling all our male colleagues and saying, no, you're not doing that. You know, like, well, we can't just not talk about this or we can't, you know, I want to talk about this or help me do this or whatever, you know, the their, their personality traits are. So they're asking for help. So we're looking for some help in these issues. Whereas I think men, again, didn't always want to admit or ask for help. And so this kind of elephant in the room just became, you know, ubiquitous in, in dentistry and the women, uh, for, for better are bringing some of these issues out for men and women. And I think it's making the, the profession better, stronger, and we're better communicators with our patients as well, men or women. So that's good. Many, I think having a, a good you, How many children did you have? I have two. I have a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old boy and girl. My um, my my mental checklist of, of going, when I try to figure it out, I, I'm, I'm seeing about a quarter of the women dentists don't have children. Are you seeing that or are you not seeing that? Um, well, I just think they're deferring too. That's the other thing is it's like, I don't know, are you going to have children or are you not going to have children? You know, ch women are having children into their forties now. And I've, so, um, it's hard to still predict, I think where that's all going to, uh, pan out, but yeah, or, or they have one child, you know, they, and because it is hard. I mean, trying to juggle all that, um, that's what I try to in, in, incorporate and help the women when I'm, uh, you know, doing some coaching and things with them is okay. Well, here's how we got to manage this. You got to have some systems. <laughs> we got to have some strategies, and we're gonna have to delegate because if you don't have those skills, it's really hard to be successful in our profession. Okay, um, I've only got you for a couple more minutes. Uh, so your email is intentionaldental at gmail dot com. If they want to question, have a question for you, or want you to speak yeah. at their organization, and and walk them through. Should they go to what will they find at www.beyond32teeth.com, and what will they find at www.intentionaldental.com? So at the beyond32teeth.com site, that's my blog site, and but soon transforming into my full website. So eventually, like the first of the year, they'll it'll be a one-stop shopping. They can just go to beyond32teeth.com, and then intentional at, dental will be gone. Um, it, intentional dental will be the 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 speaking and consulting component on the on the overall site. So that'll still be there, um, but that's more of the logistics. And if you want to book me as a speaker, you want me to come talk to your group, you want me to write an article, you want me to consult your team, you want to have a team retreat. That's something else I've been doing in the last year, and I've always done with my teams is a retreat where we work through some things. So that's the, uh, that's more of the intentional dental. Uh, dot com site where the logistical um, pieces are. You can find out more about me and kind of what I courses I offer, things like that. Whereas the Beyond Thirty Two Teeth is more of um, you get a flavor from me. <laughs> Would you want to hire me? Would you want to? Um, what am I, I love, about? I love reading your stuff. You are a prolific writer. How often do you release something? How often do you write something? 
Um, you know, gosh, I've been writing for Dr. By Cuspid at least monthly. Um, Dentistry IQ, some dental products report, you know, probably at least a couple others a month, and then my blog at least a month, if not more, every month. So I probably, I don't know, I probably release something every couple of weeks at least, if not more. I like to, I'm a social media fan too, so I love my Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and so if people like to do that, they can find me on those social media sites that I love to create memes and put out public health messages, if you will, <laughs> on those. That's it, that, I, I, I don't do Instagram. That's the one where I, uh, because it, you, know, you can't do that on a desktop. You can only do that on your iPhone. Yeah, smartphone. and I'm always on the go, so it fits me well, and I love pictures. So I love making those little memes and, like, uh, I don't know, I'm always, you know, life is a picture to me. I'm, wherever I am, I'm always snapping pictures like, oh, that'd be a great message. Oh, this would make is, a great is Instagram Is Instagram, you know, first it was Pinterest. If, if you were a visual person and liked just visual, it was Pinterest, and Pinterest was huge and exploding and rocking out. But I noticed when Facebook bought Instagram, do you think that – Kind of uh, was the um, the end of uh, Pinterest, and now the real Pinterest um, fans of, are, are really going to be Instagram. I don't know. A lot of people really still love their Pinterest. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are just huge into Pinterest. I, I just never got into that. I guess I was saturated with social media to a point. At that point, I was like, I can't take on one more thing. But I know if you get hooked on that early, then you just love Pinterest. I just happened to get hooked on Instagram earlier and liked that that avenue so but you're right probably you know that probably did influence it a little bit when uh um instagram was bought by facebook what, what i liked about pinterest was you could um and like when a lady asked um, well when was my child's teeth going to come in i'd say well are you on pinterest she said yeah and i said well go to at howard fran and i have all the tooth eruption charts i have all the home care instructions um it just seemed like all the women in the practice were on Pinterest and when yeah. instead of giving them a physical sheet and then they'd pull out their iPhone, they'd pull up uh, at Howard Ferran and, and then they'd have the tooth eruption chart and they could, right. you know. I think that's could, savvy. I mean, we have to do that. We have to be communicators and know what our patients, what their channels of communication. We, I might love Instagram, but if my patients love Pinterest, then I need to be on Pinterest if that's what I'm trying to use social media for. Like for me, um, you know, I, I'm looking to see where my clients might be. Facebook is heavily my generation. A lot of, you know, uh, people are on Facebook. Um, so I use that quite often. But Instagram gets a little bit more of the millennials in there. And, you know, it changes every week from Snapchat to something hard. It's hard to keep up. Um, but I think we have to know how our patients are communicating and, and target them. So, it's, yeah, I love it's it. A whole other thing to learn. And to I know. have so many moms come in and they'll just sit there and say, "Oh, I really love that what you post on Pinterest that the gum disease was contagious and you had the the, the knife and the fork and the pink and all that stuff." And you know, I mean, I, I and, and what I like about it is is not only did she get her home care instructions or got her question answered by a graph on Pinterest, but now she's connected to me. Yeah, absolutely. But hey, we are completely out of time. We went two okay. minutes over time, but. Uh, Hey, I'm your biggest fan. Lisa, thank you so much for giving me an hour of your life today. Well, I'm a big fan of yours too, Howard. I appreciate what you're doing for the media and dentistry and all. I really appreciate the opportunity of being here today. Thank you so much. All right. And I want to be on your show someday. Yes, soon. When, and when, <laughs> what, and what is your, what is, tell them the name of your show. Um, well, your, I'm your on podcast? YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. It's so, a YouTube uh, channel? What is your YouTube channel? It's, you mean, what is it? What's the name of it? Or what yeah, is it? Yeah, how do they find it? It's Elisa Knowles. It's just, just catch me on YouTube. And, Lisa, and so go to YouTube and put Lisa Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Did they yeah. put the DDS or just Lisa Knowles? It's just Lisa Knowles. And the funny thing is there's a singer <laughs> named Lisa Knowles. So not the singer. Um, she's African American. There should be, um, you know, a, I'm I'm white Caucasian. The white Caucasian Lisa Knowles non singer, the dentist one. So and, what, and what's the uh, the other one you said? She's what Jamaican? Uh, I'm not or sure. What? African American. African American. And what's her? Yeah, genre? I think she's Country related or? to Beyonce. Uh, I'm trying keep trying to figure out how I'm related to Beyonce Knowles as well. But I think this woman is Lisa Knowles is some relation to Beyonce. Or Beyonce's last name is Knowles. Yeah, yeah. That's how I tell. That's why I tell mill millennials to help remind remember me. I'm like uh, Knowles, like Beyonce, and they you know they laugh and other people look at me like, huh? <laughs> I was like, never mind. <laughs> well, you know, you're really at the top of your game when your name goes down to one, like Bono or Madonna yeah. or Beyonce. <laughs> right. I mean, when you don't even have a last name, that's, that's man, that's the ultimate brand. Yeah. But, uh, yep. Okay, well, thank you so much for an hour of your time. 
All right. Thank you, Howard. Bye-bye.